Hi there, Gorge Poetry Show. Here I am with Daryl App, a Hamilton based poet of three books, uh, all of whom are excellent in my opinion, and you should all be aware of him. Here is one. And hopefully we'll get Daryl to uh, read from that almost immediately. Um, okay. He has had how many publications and magazines over the last two years? I believe 130 <laughs> magazines. Uh -huh. Six continents. Nice, nice the going there. Of Antarctica. Okay, That's no a Antarctica. Tough to <laughs> um, Daryl, I've noticed uh, mainly from talking to you and from your Facebook posts, you are unstinting in your efforts to spread the message far and wide, and you have done your best to penetrate the American poetry market as well as the Canadian one. And I'd like uh, maybe for you to talk a little bit about that uh, particular effort. Well, I suppose it just seemed to me originally that to uh, help my work find its audience, you had to sort of get out there and uh, meet people, which uh, is kind of funny because it seems like oftentimes a poet has a natural predisposition to be a hermit. Uh -huh. So my uh -huh. plan A was to never go outside and just stay home. But um, I thought if I don't do this, nobody else will. So I've done a lot of readings and um, I've never had a bad one yet. That's good. Because it seems to me like if you say we're having a poetry reading tonight, someone who shows up and walks through the door and chooses to is going to be more average than your average citizen, uh -huh. more interesting than your average citizen right there. So I just met a lot of interesting people through it and yes. um, had a lot of lovely conversations around the world. Uh -huh. And um, all the readings I've done, I like to think have made me a better writer because the readings are such a powerful reminder that this is poetry, it's not a newspaper article or a laundry list. Mm. And part of the difference is that it's meant to be processed via the ear. Yes. And I think Gerald Manley Hopkins says something to the effect that before you give me the meaning of life or show me how smart you are, job one is it has to be pleasing to the ear. Uh huh. I, I get it. Which, of course, he passed that test in flying colors. Didn't he, though? Yeah. yeah. Um, so. That made me, when I would get home from a reading, be more interested, be less interested in how it looked on the page and making sure it was dainty and balanced on the page, and more interested in um, rhythm and meter and just having fun with uh, sounds. Yes. yes. So, certainly in, in my first book, written back when I uh, didn't go outside very much. <laughs> um, there were stanzas and couplets, and it looks really elegant. Yes. And um, now I'm thinking, what if this poem is heard more than it's read? What if it's heard by more people than actually read it? Um, so that's kind of made my stuff veer closer to the song end of the spectrum. Uh huh. And um, yeah, just just having fun with uh, pleasing sounds. Uh -huh. Also, um, one thing I've discovered, and I'm happy to report, is that uh, right now, poetry is having a huge resurgence on planet Earth. Hooray! Yeah. And I don't mean insta-poets or anything like that, uh -huh. but I mean um, in places like Russia and the Middle East, England and South America, uh -huh. they're having uh, huge poetry readings everywhere. Yes. In uh, Medellin, Colombia, they have a poetry festival where they uh, fill a soccer stadium. No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. And uh, Wales is really tiny, obviously, yes. but yes. Um, they have more than one poetry reading there every night of the week. Really? So just imagine people choosing to uh, turn off their computers and uh, go outside and brave the elements yes. to hear poems written by their neighbors about their neighborhood. Yes, yes. And um, what I think that's about is, I think it's uh, an act of resistance 
against the way technology has warped our communities and our relationships out of shape. Uh -huh. So uh, I've just been impressed with how uh, vital uh, hearing poems read aloud remains to be. Uh, yes, yes. Well, when you talk about some of your stuff, your early book, uh, Poaching Song, I remember the first time I saw you read, and it had a great, uh, as they say, incantatory value, power. It was very rhythmic and very powerful. And uh, That's very much what I'm going for. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's funny. Actually, um, it all started back when I, and I remember this very clearly, I was reading um, The Oresteia by Aeschylus. Yes. And um, uh, I th I, and and of course I was impressed. And then he had some some songs by the chorus in a play called The Suppliants and the Persians, uh -huh. where there was just a few bits where I was so impressed that I thought to myself, "Gee, wouldn't it be great to someday write something that has the same hypnotic." incantatory power yes, as that. Yes, yes, And that's all it took for me. Like, that's enough, you know, like, I'm sure I may never reach there, but um, that's something I always think about. Like, um, I would, the, so there is a goal to sort of write something that, and I guess this sounds arrogant. Um, Go right ahead. Be arrogant. Thanks. What if I, I wrote something that impressed someone else the way reading Aeschylus impressed me back in the day? I get you. Yeah, I get you. I used to think that about Dylan Thomas, and I, I utterly failed to do it, but I can sometimes get to it when I read Dylan Thomas in public, and people go, hey, that was pretty good, and I go, yeah, well, that's Dylan for you. You know, all you, all you have to do is mouth it, and it sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. And also, there's just such a joy in... Um, being able to have such a moment of communication with another human being. Um, yes, yes. Like, that's the great thing about books, where um, literature is a chance to have a really nice conversation with uh, the greatest people who ever lived. Indeed. So, if you're curious, to know, hey, what did Tolstoy think about Napoleon? All you have to do is stretch out your arm yeah. and take War and Peace off the bookshelf and yeah. open it, yeah. and you can have this communion. Um, even though physically Tolstoy may be dead at this moment, you can open up this book and the best part of him yes, is still right alive there. and talking about and, yeah. that's, and, that, and that's just really thrilling. Also about the incantatory thing, on a larger scale, I was kind of hoping that if people read my three books in sequence, it would kind of cast a magical spell and um, change the way they interact with their physical environment. Oh, really? Absolutely. Really? Now, this sounds funny, but um, my project is... Uh, spiritual project where the goal of my books is to slow down time now it's pretty obvious that we are obsessed with uh, speed yeah we are and uh, we say you get it in 30 minutes or else it's free <laughs> I want my food fast <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah. I want what I want when I want it or else yeah, I'm yeah. going to get really angry yeah and um Processing a poem is um, a real act of resistance against the behavior that the billionaires want you to follow. Uh -huh. Like the billionaires want you to keep on endlessly spending and consuming. Yes. They don't want you dreaming of your own dream. They want you to dream a dream that they have given you. Yes. Through Disney and through Hollywood. Yes. Yes. So. Um, in regards to speed, 
you can read a poem, and the poem documents a moment of consciousness, a fleeting moment. Yes. It takes you more than one moment to read the poem. Then you reread it, then you think about it, you go back to it. So now the ratio between the moment and the moments you've invested in it yes. keeps on changing. Uh -huh. um, so um, the end result is that you get this message that says, wait a minute, the moments that all the thousand discrete moments that make up the ligaments of your day, they are worth paying attention to. Yes. And don't just let them flow past you like water, but stop and pull them up and examine them and turn them over uh -huh. and focus uh -huh. on them. Yeah. And don't dream someone else's dream. Like, dream your own dream. Yes. And uh, the moments that make up your day, you know, they are worth paying attention to. So, um, hopefully, if they read the three books, it will help them to slow down time and have some, and take back some control over the way they process reality away from the bad guys <laughs> and uh, get it back to themselves. Yes, yes. By bad guys, you mean cultural manipulators? Yes. Well, yeah. Um, I remember um, Ernest Becker won the Pulitzer Prize for this book called The Denial of Death. Uh -huh. And he was a pioneer in the field of uh, terror management studies. Terror management studies. <laughs> yeah. That sounds ominous. Yeah. So um, his idea was that uh, most of human behavior is motivated by our fear of death. Yeah, yeah. And um, he made a lot of links between um, drinking and shopping. Really? Yeah. And about how all, how both activities are a way of distracting oneself from uh, the implications of more of uh, more mortality. Yes. Um, so it's a really good book. But I mean, if you go to a mall and you see people there, it's like. You have pants. You have a TV. What are you here for? What are you looking for? <laughs> right. Better pants and better TVs. Yeah. yeah, but it's also about what are you running from? They're running from having to deal with the facts of their own existence yes. and drugging them with endless consumption. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, here's a funny story. So after. Um, September 11th happened in 2001. The president said... Um, oh, right, go shopping. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. He said, America, don't stop shopping. Keep yeah. endlessly shopping. Yeah. Because if you stop shopping, the, our enemies have won. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's like, well, I don't want to shop. I, I like what I have. What do you mean? Right? Yeah, well, yeah. I get... Am I not patriotic because I don't want to shop right now? Uh -huh. And then on the other hand, in the Bible, St. Paul said, I have trained myself to be content in all circumstances. Really? Yeah. I don't remember that quote, but I won't yeah. deny it. Okay. Now, um, well, I mean, it's not a quote because he said it in Greek. Uh, oh, okay, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a translation, right? Yeah. Um, but that's what he said. He said the appropriate way to live is to be thankful in all circumstances. Oh, and okay. Gratefulness, I dig it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Now, it's funny. How many moments does our culture provide you where you're encouraged to be grateful? None. It's based on endless envy and desire and, and prodding yes. those, yes. those, those claims of... Uh, of uh, envy and jealousy uh -huh. to boost the economy. Sure. Now the funny thing is, if everybody did what St. Paul did, what would happen to the economy, <laughs> right? Would flatline. Yeah. <laughs> so that so that would, would uh, be a problem. Yes. So yes. Um, it just seems like um, if you weren't paying attention to this stuff. Yeah. Um, the, the economic numbers will be in the driver's seat every time. Yeah. And everything yeah. else will be just an app, just an afterthought. Yeah. Yeah, that's capitalist culture for you for sure. And uh, I've had endless debates with, with with various friends and acquaintances over, you know, is is greed the great sin of capitalism? 
or is it the great sin of human nature? And that has been debated in various coffee shops and bars, but with uh, many people. And uh, sometimes I think it is just human nature, and to, to label it as capitalism is uh, avoiding the actual main issue that we are we we are sort of greedy and competitive by nature. But then others have, have said, no, 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 we're not. <laughs> so, you know, it can go on and on and on as a debate. But, and it's a very viable debate and very interesting. Well, I guess René Girard uh, spoke a lot about that. Uh -huh. He was an on, on, uh, anthropologist who did yes. a lot of work on um, mimetic rivalry and said that, a bit different than Becker, he said most of human nature is um, based on... Uh, um, imitation and competition and desire and yes, yes. Um, once you once you assume scarcity yeah and you see something someone has something you that you don't have yes. you automatically want it <laughs> and you yes. learn through imitating and, it seems like it yeah, yeah. and um, also he wrote a lot about um, uh, the uh, scapegoating mechanism, uh -huh. how a tribe will unite itself together yes. by pointing its finger outside, it's yes. outside the tribe, at the other, yes. and how you need that, right? Yes. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, Why uh, we need enemies. Yeah, and uh, breaking from that is pretty hard, right? Yeah, it is, it is. Yeah. But, um, I mean, so you feel when you were saying the incantatory power of your poems, if if they're well read as they often are, almost always are, and uh, are listened to carefully, that helps break the spell of the endless cycle of uh, buy, buy, envy, buy, you know, and gives people moments of serenity in which to contemplate their existence outside of that. I suppose the first step would be. Um, Reading the books would leave the reader more inclined to pay attention to their surroundings. Yes, yes. And not just sleepwalk through their day. Yes, yes. And where it takes them from there, maybe that's not for me to say. Uh -huh. But um, I think it's a little alarming how little attention people pay to their own lives. <laughs> Yeah. So they get caught up in the ritual of it and the in the patterns of behavior. Yeah. Well, certainly habit is very strong in humans. You yes, know. it is. Yes. You know, but habits are hard to change. But um, yeah, I, I, I think the idea is that um, first off, you force people to when you read a poem or listen to a poem, you are choosing to do an activity which does not contribute to the GDP, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And right there, that's a suspicious thing to be doing. Right, right. Because um, normally in life, it's like, what's in it for me? What's what's the pay per hour, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. if I say I'm investing a lot of mental energy into processing a poem, and yes. it will not benefit me in any material sense, yes. um, Right there, that's a pretty big leap to be making first time. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, um, I just, yeah, and then it's just a different way of uh, making sense of your own uh, experience. Mm. For example, writing books is a good way to uh, learn about yourself. Like now that I now I can look back at the books I've written and say, oh wow, I didn't know this, but it turns out I'm re I'm really unhealthily obsessed about X, right? Now mm. I know, right? Mm. Because to write a book, you have to go to the thing that really excites you or or oh, you're for really sure. obsessed about. Right? Yeah, for sure. And uh, so it's an interesting way to learn about yourself, you know, yeah. through that process. But um, I think anyone's life would benefit from reading poetry and from writing it themselves like mm -hmm. I can't imagine you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know I would say to people um, do the thing that nobody else can do uh, and um, what is individually you yeah and 
if you watch season X of a television show, yes, you're doing something that a million other people have done. Anyone can do it. Right. But if you write a book, for better or for worse, you did something that nobody else can do. And what better way to celebrate being alive, at the very least? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh... Celebrate being alive. Yeah, uh, Do you think uh, dancing celebrates being alive? Dancing? Sure. I've heard a lot of people say that over the years. Um, I certainly... I don't dance as much now that I'm an old guy, but I used to a lot when I was younger. Um, was I going to say? Yeah, um, well, before we started the camera, you spoke, uh, much to my uh, pleasure and surprise, of your experience in the theater and acting and teaching acting. And I'm, I've been wondering all along if, if that informs your poetic practice in any way, that previous experience in the theater. Well, um, I had a lot of good things happening when I was working in the theater, but yes. in terms of the poetry, and also this year I've done a lot of writers' workshops where yes. um, aspiring writers ask me for advice. Yes. And yes. to be honest, um, most of the advice I end up giving is advice I've stolen from, uh, <laughs> from uh, David Mamet. Oh, yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 100%. Writing in restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> I um, read that one. So there's a lot of advice that he has that, it, that, um, that anyone would benefit from. Uh -huh. And um, one thing he says, he says, arrive late, leave early. Ooh. And when I say that to people, it often ends up clearing up a lot of roadblocks for them. Really? Big, big time. And uh, what it means is that if you're writing a scene or a poem or a book, whatever, uh -huh. um, if you start the action with the if you start telling your story with the scene already in progress, there's a lot of benefits you get from that. Like, um, first off, I mean, if you're married to someone for 40 years, you don't sit down for breakfast and say, hello, my wife Susan, who I met in 19 book. Yeah. Um, it is a nice day outside on her, in her house on 1713 Mockingbird Lane. Yeah. You don't say that. Because you've spent so much time together, you have all these like shared memories and associations and secret codes. Sure. So it's more like the spouse says, Remember Tom at the barbecue? And the other person says, huh. And that gives you a better sense that these are people who actually spend a lot of time together. Yeah. And that's how, that's more like real life. Right? Yeah, sure. Um, so that has the benefit of creating verisimilitude and um, seems less phony. And also, if you start your scene with it already in progress, the yes. reader has to pay more attention to get up to speed on things. Right, so right. So it's a sneaky way of increasing his interest. Sure, I get you. So oftentimes people will show me their short story, uh -huh. and I'm like, your story starts on page seven. Your story, oh, yes, right. Your story yeah. should start on page one. Right, I hear you, yeah. Because they just start off with like, setting the stage, yes. the mood, yes. or yes. writing about weather, which is the kiss of death. <laughs> Don't and, write about the weather. And I say, just jump right in there. And yeah. then once you do that, when it comes to description, you'd be surprised how a little really goes a long way. Yes. Right? And then also, leave early. If you have a poem or a play or something, uh -huh. and you have all this internal structure that is leading up to this certain ending, yes. and everything is telegraphing this certain ending, Yes. and the audience can smell it, and you black out and bring down the curtain a semitone before that happens. Mm -hmm. Now the audience member, he has to think, well, wait a minute, what the hell happened next? He has to replay in his mind, fill in the pieces, think about where the characters went, and that's when your art has a chance to actually be haunting. Yes. And yes. that's when it really sticks with me, right? Uh huh. So, uh -huh. Um, there are certain theater things about being concise and getting out of your own way and being honest that certainly help in the yeah. writing of poetry or anything. Right. Um, another thing David Mehmet said was never invent, never deny, which means you'll see an actor, like, a, I mean, if you have a new actor, you always have to say, put your hands down. 
<laughs> because a novice actor always thinks, man, I have to sell it, I have to sell it, so I'm going to wave my arms around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? And that's horrible. That's not how life works. Uh-huh. And um, if you feel that way, you should back the train up and go back to the writing stage because everything should be on the page where if the actor just reads what's there, it should work. Otherwise, you, you have a different kind of problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, when he says, never deny, he means, let's say you're doing a really tense, serious scene. Yes. And you feel the urge to, to like, uh, uh, giggle. Yeah. Um, don't pretend it didn't happen. Yeah. Now, sometimes when people are under stress or trauma or don't know what to say next or they feel that pressure, um, some people laugh as a way of um, de-stressing or something. Yeah. So if that just comes to you, don't go, oh, no, I'm embarrassed. Maybe uh-huh. that's something you can use. Yes. Because yes. that is something that's actually unscripted and real. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also, it's just about mainly just getting out of your own way and getting rid of the fancy stuff. Uh-huh. Like, um, David Mamet also said, every story should answer two questions. Really? And the two questions are, what does he want and why now? <laughs> oh, he's sharp. That right. Boy. He's sharp. And that's a fan, you know, and like, what that means is, um, like, if you write something, um, your mom will like it because your mom likes everything you do. Yeah. But if I'm not your mom, I don't know you. Yeah. Why should I invest my time in it? Yeah. Right? You've got to work to hook me. Yeah. And yeah. the sooner you drop the conflict into the mix and you know, tell me what is at stake here. Yes. The more likely you have of creating that magical spell between the reader and the writer, where the reader is invested in your struggle. Yes. So yes. if you start off with like seven pages of weather. Right, it's not going to happen. It's impossible. Right. right. So, what can you do tonight to make it seem like in your, whatever you're writing, there is something at stake? There is a there is a conflict. If I don't get this, I'm going to die. You know, and an actual conflict or roadblock that your guy has something to push up against. Uh huh. Uh huh. When you talked about. Uh, Dropping the the experiencer or the reader into the middle of the 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 action or the drama, I suddenly thought of uh, I think Andre Gregory's uh, version of Uncle Vanya called yeah, yeah. Uncle Vanya and Forty Second Street, where they're walking to the theater. And I remember seeing that for the first time and being immediately gripped. And I think, do you see Wallace Shawn first walking down the street and trying to cross? And then they come in. He comes in late. They're already practicing. I thought that was just marvelous. Yeah. And and, uh, but I mean, like, let's say you were doing a movie about a bank robbery. Yes. And the banker sit down, and the bank robber sit down and say, "Okay, hello, fellow bank robber, we're going to rob a bank." Yes. But if you know, but if instead you see two people sitting down, and they say, um, "Did you get the thing?" And the person says, "What the hell do you think?" Of course, I got the thing. It's like so we're all set then. Yeah. What about later? What do you mean? What about later? Yes. I'm talking about this about, about this about the split. What do you think? Yes. Yes. What? You don't think, right? Yeah. Suddenly, the narrator, suddenly the viewer, has to prick up his ears to get it to speed. Yeah. yeah. And and also right there, um, the uh, like this isn't an establishing an establishing shot of a sunrise. These are <laughs> the, these are people who are fighting for something. Yes. So yes. there's a conflict right in your face from the first frame. Right. Right. Which just helps, you know. Like yeah. um, it's hard enough to hold a reader's attention in 2019. Like yeah. don't make it so hard for them. You know? Yeah. Um, and yet. I mean, uh, I was talking to uh, my partner Cynthia, and she was talking about her continued great joy in rereading many of the uh, stories of Alice Munro, yeah. and uh, how riveting she. Well, she didn't use the word riveting, but I think that's what she meant. You just sort of fall into it, and you're gripped by it, and you, and not to deny her. Uh, uh, um, Alice's uh, great abilities, but there is a certain conventionality to her structures, even though the time slips are quite inventive. Um, but she has this ability to uh, grab you with some small image or metaphor, or you know, and um, the small town conflicts. 
in the early books anyway. And, but I do recall the first time I got into Alice Munro, I had a driving job. And the only good thing to listen to back in the 70s was CBC Radio. And once a week they had somebody read Lives, Lives of Girls and Women. Cool. And I followed that through. And that was, I mean, she was just a starting out writer at the time. Wow. Just another, and I just, I kind of, you know, kind of fell into the story. And, um, but that's because it was being read to me. Would I have picked up the book? Probably from reviews, but still, there's a, there's a certain, uh, I guess, incantatory power, again, to reading. And I'm, I, I remember thinking afterwards, because obviously that's very early on and she wants great things after that, um, being read stories by kindergarten teachers and whatnot. You know, does it, does it go all the way back to that? And read stuff by my mother, you know. Um, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon, that whole thing of falling into the story because somebody's yeah. reading it to you. you and, know? and it really is a magical thing. It's yeah. like, um, you know how, like if you have a plum, like if your pl uh, plumbing is leaking, you hire the plumber to fix it so it doesn't leak. It's real right. binary, it's yes or yep. no, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, in the art, it's a bit different. But it is true that if your story doesn't work, you know, you, you don't have to be an expert to know it's yes. not working. Anybody, yes. Anyone can smell it. Yeah. And the fact is, when a story makes you say, I want to know what happens next, yes. that's when the magic has really happened. Right, I and, agree. Um, yeah. One thing for me that I always think about, and it's kind of a big deal for me, um, Henrik Ibsen mm. wrote a bunch of plays. Sure, and <laughs> he certainly did. He sure did. And he won a lot of awards. Uh -huh. and, and he was huge in his time, apparently. Oh, yeah, definitely. Theaters would fight over getting the first production of the new play. Yeah. Yeah. And um, who knows how many people have written their PhDs on him or whatever. Uh -huh. So one time, uh, Anton Chekhov, my hero, yes. um, went to see a production of The Doll's House by Henry Gibson. Uh -huh. And um, halfway through, Anton Chekhov turned to his friend and said, but real life isn't like this at all. Yes. And he was right. Uh -huh. And that's why Chekhov is major and Ibsen is minor. Ooh, now there's a statement. Okay. That's right. Because um, it's possible you could score higher on IQ tests than I could. And uh -huh. Uh -huh. But the fact is, in real life, people don't talk in five-minute speeches yeah. de de yeah. declaiming about the uh, proletariat or the rights of man. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's phony, hammy, show off -y. Yeah. And it's wrong. And it's bad art. Yeah. And um, on the other hand, if you look at Chekhov, it's like, maybe I'm not a cobbler in Siberia, but I'll be reading a story about him. And yes. I'm totally plugged in because he has zoomed in um, not on like the topical hot button issues, but on what is universal to the hu human experience. Yeah. Things that Ibsen never touched. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned. Uh -huh. Think, um, things like dealing with um, aging and loss and yes. uh, regrets and um, you know people dealing with a dream that didn't come true. Yes, yes. So for me, that story is a, is a real touchstone for me. And uh -huh. there's all sorts of um, writing that people tell me, oh, you have to like so-and-so. <laughs> and I just think, I don't think it would pass Chekhov's uh, sniff test. Okay. Well, I mean, certainly he's one of the greats. And I, I immediately want to ask you, who's your favorite translator of Chekhov? Or do you have one? Oh, you know, it's funny. Um, there have been a few good ones, but... Um, for sentimental reasons, you can't really knock Constance Garnett. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, she was such an interesting person, and she yes. did so much work, right? And all the dust against her, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And now there's different versions. Yeah. But I still stick with the Constance Garnett version at the moment. Uh -huh. um, it's a, kind of like with the Bible, how now there's new translations of the Bible where, yeah. where, uh, where people say, hey, guess what? Since 1611, we have found new manuscripts. Yes. Ones that they didn't have. So my new version of the Bible is more accurate. So here you see the King James Version had mistakes. And how he fixed those mistakes. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you made new mistakes. <laughs> because yeah. you're also yeah. a human being. Yes, yes. Right? So translating is... Um, 
you know, there have been some translations of Dostoevsky where the upper class people have British accents. Yeah, yeah. Like, and yeah. It's, uh, it's funny, I've known Russians who are really baffled to come to the Western world and see how their guys are treated. Oh, really? Because, for example, um, I've talked to Russians who said that English people rate Tolstoy a lot higher than they do. Really? Because they say um, in the original, uh -huh. Tolstoy is kind of a bit more of a uh, blowhard yes. going on and on. Yes, yes. And that constant garnish. Constant Garnet kind of uh, clean them up a bit. I see. I see. I've heard. I've heard that blowhard uh, criticism before, but I, I'm not familiar enough with Tolstoy to really comment. But certainly, yeah. yes. And also, Dostoevsky has suffered because um, uh, the whole carnivalization that Mikhail Bakhtin talked about with yes. Dostoevsky. Yes. Um, it just goes to show you, like Dostoevsky thought he was writing comedies. Yeah. Um, and there's so much of his humor that just doesn't translate. Yeah. So now it's like the cliche of Dostoevsky is just this oppressively sweaty, seething, yeah. brooding, yes. you know, yes. heaven and hell. And um, in, the, and in the original, um, he does little skits within bits in different voices and different yes. tones yes and that's really lost right so that's uh -huh. tough but yeah. um, lost in translation I tell you I had German friends tell me that uh, the English translations of Hermann Hesse were not nearly as poetic as the original German wow. and that's some years ago but um, yeah it's, I think it's true now Daryl we're down to our last kind of like four minutes right so I'd love you to read a couple of poems for everyone because you haven't experienced Daryl till you've experienced Daryl, let me tell you. So fire okay, away, sure. my friend, fire sure. away. Anything you like. Well, thanks. So this is a poem called Weather Report. Yeah. Unnoticed, grace rolls in from the northwest, raining down on rub and tugs and cemeteries, the tenements with the asbestos and the live wires. That rich duke's house, they turned into a museum. Swarma huts and money marts, raining down on the just and unjust with no questions asked. Anil Verma scratches to win like his life depends on it. Over his shoulder, his shadow is laughing at him. Moisha gets tagged by the new red light cameras. Adrian thinks of going back to school for something practical. And when things get tight, everybody stares into a glowing screen. We have at least that much in common. Dean's on his knees again, hoping Jesus grades on a curve. Zero percent financing, half off, one day only. It's raining harder now, down the graffiti-stained plywood where the windows used to be. And something about how the walls meet the roof makes me weepy, jittery. Something is up tonight. We tighten our grip on our remote controls. Grace comes to town and we don't even hit pause. As it rains all the way to the Erie Canal and down on a drafty row house, sublet to a sensitive soul, riding a crest of bad luck. Next to his toilets, a million-selling how-to book called Your Best Life Now. The author's incisors twinkle like stars. Excellent. I love that. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, sir. Grace. It's a great thing to write about. I've tried it a few times myself. Um, does grace descend from up there, or does it come from down here and float up? I've often wondered about that. Well, I, you know, Simone Weil had that book, Gratitude and Grace, uh -huh. and I actually think that there's a relationship between um, gratitude and grace. Yes. So, if you're serious about looking for it, uh -huh. first you'd have to practice being grateful. Yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally into that. I love it. And uh, by being grateful, you surrender to what's being given to you and then grace appears with that surrender perhaps well again everyone else around you 
and you can feel the pressure right now to spend, to shop. Yes, yes. And that's about making you ungrateful. Yes. Um, but your next breath is a gift. Yeah, so. for sure. And on that, your next breath is a gift. I'm afraid we're going to have to end. But you can be sure, friends of Poetry Show, there will be more Daryl Epp another time. Thanks. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you very much for having me. You're most welcome. Next time, friends, 